everyone, and welcome to the functions example. This is our example program for this week to show you how to apply functions and modulizing your program, validating your program, and also look, looking at scope and, um, and passing of variables within your program, uh, like we talked about in the videos for this week. All right? So let's take a look at how we apply all of this and how I want you to apply all of this to your programs now and into the future. Uh, I believe what I'm trying to do here is I write these programs, and there's several different ways of doing them, I agree, but I wanted to create some consistency with how you write your programs. That consistency makes it easier for you to follow, helpful, and also hopefully it makes it easier for you to understand. So what I'm going to try to do is take the things that we've actually done in previous programming like classes, uh, your initial ones, and apply that to this Python program as we get through, as we go through some of the modularization, if you will, of this. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So as you can see here, uh, one of the things that you'll start noticing throughout this program is I do a lot of documenting. This is something I expect you to do in your program. Uh, as I have stated many times in other classes probably is that a little bit of documentation goes a long way. A few seconds to document something uh, could save hours later on for somebody who's maintaining this program. Or it could save you hours if all of a sudden you put this program away and you come back to it wondering why you did it this way. A little bit of documentation doesn't hurt anything, and it really does not take that much time. It's something you should get used to and apply to everything that you're writing in your programs. As you see, mines are very simple, and the simplicity is the key here. You don't need to go into hours or, or paragraphs of stuff. Just keep it very simple what you're trying to do and explain it in good English. Use as many words as necessary to actually say what the, what the uh, function or the program is doing. And I believe that, like I said, everybody's going to benefit from it. All right. So I went ahead and said, you know, kind of did the typical thing we've done so far with our programs up here, our functions examples and Bob Yields. And then we kind of get into the function name. OK, and we'll start talking about what these functions. These are how I decided I wanted to define my functions based upon my design. How we designed our functions uh, should be no different than how we designed it in Visual Basic when we learned how to modulize there, uh, when we use a structure chart to figure out how to break things down from getting our input to uh, doing our calculations to uh, displaying our output. Uh, looking at that thing should be, the, looking at that structure chart and how you applied that should be no different than how you apply it here in Python. Why does it have to be? And if you look at how it actually works in Python, you'll see that it actually works pretty neat and very slick and very clean uh, once we go through it and understand a little bit of how all this works. So I'm going to show you how to be as consistent as possible in doing so. Now, as you see here, we have our functions defined prior to when we ever call. This is one of the rules I told you in the previous uh, videos, that we must define all functions prior to actually being called. So here's one being called here, validate integer input. It must be about, it must be defined prior to using it. Okay? It doesn't have to be defined to be the first one or so on. It just makes it easier to kind of flow in the order of, I say, define your functions in the order of they're actually being called. It makes a little sense to me. It does logical sense. It doesn't have to from a, uh, a working point of view, but uh, from a reading point of view, it makes a lot of sense to me. Okay? All these functions that when we execute the program will completely be ignored uh, and, and basically this code right here will not be executed and it only will be executed when it's actually called. So until it's called, nothing will actually happen. It will keep rolling down, uh, the interpreter and, and the executor will basically keep rolling down until it finds code outside the functions to actually start uh, utilizing or running, if you will, all right? So the first thing in this particular program I have this little area, I call it my controlling main code for the application. It controls the flows for pennies to pay. Once again, I expect you to have that there. Tell me what this, this main body's doing, okay? I'm writing this very similar to how you would see it in the C language. C has a main void type of function to it. Python does not, it's just open-ended. There's no boundaries around it whatsoever. It's gonna run code outside of your functions, top down, wherever you put it at. In this case, I hope you put it at the bottom here and have it all contained within a nice little area like this. Okay, let's kind of see how it's doing. If we go back to how we started, stated how a program should be written, it basically should be written in the way of declaring your variables, go getting your input, 
you know, getting your, uh, doing your calculations, and then finally displaying your output. And that's pretty much what I have here. I went ahead and I declared my variables. Number of days is my input. Employee total pay uh, float equals zero is my output. I declared these. I, I, I cast them, if you will, as an integer and a float. Okay. Um, I just think it's good to cast it. It tells the, the computer exactly what it's going to put to be in there. And I think it's also good to define these variables in one location versus all the way through your program. It's hard to follow. Uh, it's hard to understand, okay? If you have them in a certain location, everybody can understand them. Again, I didn't have to do it that way. I could have not done this and just introduced number of days right here. It would have been perfectly fine. It would have worked fine. However, once again, once these programs start getting long and sophisticated, trying to keep up with all the different variables that are being defined throughout your program becomes a little bit difficult. I think it's a little bit easier putting them in one location to make sure everybody understands exactly what it is you're doing and what and where we're at. Okay, makes sense? So we'll keep that consistency, if you will, all right? The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and go get my input. Now, this is obviously different than uh, a visual type environment where this is more you know, a command prompt environment where we're getting our data. So what we're gonna be doing is I'm gonna take this STR flag, which I defined right here as a Boolean, either true or false, I'm gonna set it to false. And first time through, it will be false. And I basically this flag is gonna be one to say, is it validated, okay? And so uh, in this case, I'm gonna have INT number of days equals input enter number of days work. So I'm gonna get my input like we've already learned about. I'm gonna bring that in. I'm going to then send that to uh, my validate input integer in which it's going to go ahead and take that data and validate it for me. It's gonna validate it based upon some of the things we talked about before, range, type of data, uh, existence, and so on. Remember those three things, existence, range, and type of data. I, I have a routine that you can actually utilize yourself, copy and paste and modify, if you will, that will actually do that, okay? And if we, if done correctly, you might be able to reuse it over and over for, again for different types of, uh, excuse me, for different types of input that you'd be using, all right? Once everything is good, it's gonna pass back the validated number of days. That's what I did here. I'm, I'm passing that back. What, I'm taking that number of days that it gave me and I'm passing back a validated number of days. And once that's good and everything is good and it falls out of this loop, I'm going to uh, go ahead and then do my calculations. I'm going to call calc pay with the number of days from my input and then return the total pay, the total value back here on the employee total pay. Finally, I'm going to display. So as you see, I modulized my program. I kept this as clean as it can be. I don't, do a, I don't do any kind of really processing here other than that loop to try to get my data in, uh, and, and no other calculations are done. These will be all done in the functions. Very similar, and again, uh, what do you want to say, consistent with how you should have learned this before. Make sense? All right, so let's start walking through some of these uh, functions, if you will. So the first one is going to be input. I got my input. I'm going to validate in integer input. I call it integer input because that's exactly what it's going to be doing. It's validating if it's an integer or not. In this case, I'm taking any data that I might pass to it for that validation. Uh, I could write this again to make it very consistent to admit, you know, that I could have any integer type of input. Say I have five or six different inputs that are integers. I can write one routine that just checks for validation to see if it's actually an integer. I don't have to check for range in that particular one. Maybe I do that in a different function, but in this case, I'm doing them both. Hopefully I'm not confusing you there, but in this case, I'm bringing in my input. I'm going to use this try accept return piece. I'm going to try to move, I'm going to try to cast whatever input they gave me and make it an integer. Meaning if, I, if they give me ABC, it will not cast as an integer, and it's going to go down to the accept down here and say uh, number of days must be numeric. Does that make sense? So it's going to try it. If it doesn't work, it's going to uh, throw an exception and go from there. What do you think? Makes sense? If it does cast it, if it is an integer, or in any case, if it's a number, even if it's a uh, probably 22.5, we'll just truncate that 0.5, it'll put that there, and then it's going to check I'm checking for range here also in this particular function, where it's going to make sure that it's greater than zero. If it's greater than zero, I'm going to set my flag to true, all right? 
If it's not greater than zero, I'm going to say number of days must be positive. All right. And then the flag will stay as false. And in this case here, once it goes down here, I return my input. OK. And this is how it should it, it would actually work. All right. And it will come back here. If it stays false, it'll loop back through again. I see for a number of days worked. OK. Let's play around with this a little bit, see if we can go through it. OK. Number one. So it's, if we go into this thing and I sit back and I put HHH uh, -H -H in there. Uh, it's going to come back and say number of days must be numeric, okay? It, uh, so I keep doing this, and you can see it's actually validating. If I put negative 10 in there, okay, number of days must be positive. That's an issue right then and there, okay? Uh, we want this to be a positive integer. Even though it's a negative integer and is an integer, I want it to be a positive integer in this case, okay? Now if I go ahead and put good data in there, what should happen is it should work however it's not why is that why is that are you saying oh my god why do i pay for this class your teacher doesn't know what he's doing uh, probably, probably a good statement nonetheless i think i do know what i'm doing so why do you think this is not working okay if i sit back and i go here i i say go validate my integer input Everything else seems to be working. My STR flag is false coming up here, but everything is good. But for some reason, I'm telling it to set my STR flag to true. But I guess my assumption is, is that that STR flag is never getting to true. Why would that be? Anyone? 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 All right, good. I'm hoping all you guys are answering this question. I don't know if you are or not, but we'll go ahead and talk about why it's not true. In this particular case, what we have done is we defined STR flag as a Boolean variable. What kind of scope is this? If you recall from the video, I told you there's two different types of scope when it comes to uh, Python. There is global and there is, um, there is local, correct? All right. STR flag is being defined outside of any function. So what is it? It's global. Very good. That means we should be able to access it from any other function around. All right. That sounds logical. And so I define this thing here. That's all good. It comes up here. Well, I should be able to access it right here. I should be able to change it, correct? That's not how it quite works in, in, in Python. Uh, there's some mechanisms in Python to ensure that you just can't declare a bunch of global variables and mess up a potential function, especially a potential function where they want this particular variable to be local. Meaning this, this variable by itself within this thing, just because it shares the same name, stays local until we tell it, it it's a global variable that's being used else, that was defined elsewhere. Let me say that one more time. Python's not smart enough, nor any programming language is smart enough to determine that this variable that we just defined here, okay, is a global variable. Right now, what it's saying here is, okay, you just defined a brand new local variable called str flag for this particular function, and it's going to stay local. Even though we have it defined down here, it doesn't look at it that way. It doesn't know any difference. And if we think about it, that is safe because if we actually wrote a, a function for the masses to use, it just might be by chance, right, that they actually define a global variable within their code and they call our code and, and we, they didn't really want us to change it, but it just happenstance that did that. So that's checking to make sure that it's good. So Python requires the programmer to, to be explicitly concrete that the variable that we are changing is a global variable. How do we do that? We go over here and we put global str flag. There it is right there. And now what that says to Python is in this particular function, str flag has already been defined somewhere else as a global variable and we are to, we are to update that global variable str flag which is sitting right there does that make sense you may want to rewind this thing a little bit and go through it one more time so just by defining a global variable a variable outside of the uh the functions does not allow the functions itself to just automatically change it 
It can be changed, but the way to do it is we got to tell the function that this is not a local variable, this is a global variable, and we know explicitly what we're doing. Make sense? It's not that hard, that's how it works. So now when we do this, okay, we go in here, and I see I put 000, we should get our numeric problem back, or negative 10, that's all good. And now if I put five, it now goes through and actually does the total pay. Pretty cool. So it actually then fell out of the loop because I was able to do that global variable. Now there's other ways, so I think that all works really well. I think that's a great way of doing it, a great way of using global variables. Again, I also, I love how Python deals with this because global variables are a very negative thing. Uh, in, in programming, meaning you can define a global variable in one place and all of a sudden you have this huge program and you never know where that global variable was defined and how it's being handled. This, in a, in a sense, it kind of controls it and tells the, the functions exactly what is supposed to be going on and explicitly states that the programmer knows that that is a global variable and one that I'm going to change in this particular function. We don't want to change it just by accident, that we happen to name it the same thing. I hope that makes sense to you. Kind of neat. All right. All right. So we keep going here and everything kind of worked well. So now that we got all that kind of working out, we, had, we went ahead and moved that back. So let's kind of look at a couple other things that I have here. What I did was is I returned my INT input. So I, what I needed to do if I didn't return that INT input, okay, and let's just say, let's see here, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, I, I went ahead and just did my validation, but I didn't really return it because here's what I'm returning. Look what I did here. I took this INT input and I took what it had here and I'm trying to cast it as an integer, all right? If I sit back and take this out and don't return it, even though I cast it, his number of days here uh, is going to be, um, if I just validate it and don't actually call this number of days piece right here, Okay, let's go ahead and update this a little bit and see what happens. And I go through all this, okay, and I say, I put 10 here. I say, go validate it. As you can see, I'm going to get an error. It's going to say, object cannot be interpreted as an integer. And I have this thing in this range piece here. This is kind of odd where this is actually at. So let's kind of look. This is actually, I'm doing my calculation. The problem is, is that that in a, that when I did my input here and put it in INT number of days, it considered it a string. I never casted it as an integer. You might say, well, yes, you did. You did it up here. Well, no, I didn't because I didn't return that cast input, if you will. And so that's what I need to do. I need to return that cast input with INT input. There it is right there. This then returned that particular piece of input that I sent to it, and it in a casting mode, meaning it's now an integer, because I told it to make it an integer. Sorry about that. Also, one of the things that you'll see here is that uh, because I did it that way, I decided to go ahead and make it a zero, so I won't error out in this case, and it'll, it'll always be an, you know, an integer kind of coming back. I can actually, if I wanted to, go ahead and put INT around this. So even if the data is bad, one of the things I'm going to do when I return is I'll return it as a zero if the number of days is not numeric. No big deal because I didn't change the flag, so it's just going to keep looping. So what I did here, that's why I went ahead and say input number of days. Let's see, I'm just going to take this part right here. Here we go. This is why I wrote this this way, okay? And to sit back and say, I'm going to go get my input, I'm going to pass it, and I want you to return the input that has been cast now as an integer, so now I can use this, and when I pass it again, it will be an integer. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? We are ensuring, this is probably, I don't know if it's a bad thing with, with, uh, with Python versus maybe VB. In VB, when we declare a variable, we tell it the data type, which is a beautiful thing. It always will have that. In Python, once again, when you declare a variable, it just takes on the data that you give it. The casting, by telling it's an integer, by telling it's, it's a float, uh, telling it's a Boolean, ensures the data type that's actually in there. I like that. I like that a lot. 
In this case, it didn't insure it, and that's where we got the error that it wasn't an integer. It's actually considered a string, and when I was actually up here doing some calculations uh, for a number of days, it was blowing up because it considered it a string, not an integer. By returning a casted piece right here back to it, which basically brought it over here, I'm sorry, right there, the same data, but just now cast as an integer, and allow me to move on and do everything correctly. <laughs> I hope that makes sense, okay? You may want to listen to that a couple times, but don't make that too hard. Uh, we're just ensuring that the data type is correct. All right? Finally, so what I do here then is I went ahead and I called number of, the total pay number of days. It went back up here, and I kind of took some most of the, uh, the, the um, what do you want to say, the, 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 the the code that we used for last week's assignment and just put it in here. I pass it number of days. It's going to return. It's going to loop through it using the range and everything else that we talked about last week. And then finally passing back the total number of days and returning that to the total pay. You will then call display totals, which is not that big a deal, but you can see it right here where it's going to format it for me and then display it. And now if we run this whole thing one more time, Everything should look pretty good. So if you worked 50 days, we're all gazillionaires. I don't know what the heck that would be, but it's up there. Uh, we, won't, we won't have to program anymore. Uh, and uh, if you ever reach that kind of uh, money, um, remember your dear friend Bob uh, could use some of it, okay? Anyway, this is a nice example of modularizing a program. Uh, it dealt with, in this case, everything's being passed by value. Uh, as you see, we didn't do anything by reference. The one thing, if we could pass it by reference, may have been this Boolean flag right here. But instead of doing it that way, we did it as a, uh, as a global variable. And in other cases where we actually do things by reference might be total pay. Uh, if you recall, we could have passed down the actual um, the, the output, if you will, and had it populated by reference. Because we don't deal with reference by reference for immutable type of variables that we talked about in a previous video, and I, I just decided just to return it. And so I return it to the left side of the equal sign, which eliminated the need for me to actually pass it by reference and having to deal with that. Does that make sense? That's what we did here and here and so on. When we pass down the uh, total pay, obviously by value is all we needed. So I hope that makes sense. Take a good look at this program. Apply it to your program that you're going to be working on, okay? Uh, the programs and the projects you're going to be working on. See what you can do with it. Have some fun with it. If you have questions, make sure you talk to your instructor. All right? Good luck.